Okay, evening everyone. Um, sorry for the complete nightmare about double room bookings. Um, we're joined today by Mark D'Souza from UCL. He's a lecturer in the philosophy and theory of criminal law. Um, he's here to talk today about uh, natural and corporate persons in the criminal law. So um, welcome, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, and over to you. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, it's my first time in Bayeux College. I'm quite, quite pleased with whatever room we got. I'm told the other room was nicer, but I'll find out next time. This room is nicer. Oh, good, good. I got lucky then. Uh, right. Um, so this paper um, is quite unlike what I normally do. Um, it's ostensibly about corporate criminal law, and I realize it's a fairly weird way to start a paper which has so much corporate criminal law in it. But hopefully you, you get what I mean by the end of this presentation. Um, I'm actually quite agnostic about whether we actually need the criminal law to deal with companies and to influence companies' behaviors. Um, I'm not going to take a position on that in this paper. What I will do instead is, just for the, for the purpose of speaking to the real world, since we have corporate criminal liability across the world, let's assume that we should have some form of criminal liability for companies. The next question is, well, why should we do that? And that's also a very big question, one that I can't answer here, but my sense is that to the extent that we have a good reason for having criminal liability for companies, it's got to do with the one thing that a criminal conviction can provide that other forms of liability cannot, which is a conviction. So a conviction is unlike tort liability. So you're not just found liable for a breach of regulations or rules. You're convicted, you're found guilty of a crime. And these are big words. They carry a lot of moral import, lots of, a lot of moral significance. Um, all other forms of, liable, of uh, consequences can be provided for by other forms of liability, tort liability, regulatory consequences, uh, consequences in terms of being excluded from applying for certain contracts, etc. But the conviction can't. Now, I don't have to be, have to tie myself to any particular theory of punishment to say that this sounds like what it means is that the conviction is important. And what about the conviction is important then? Well, the conviction is, is a communication, it's a public com communication, um, very strongly worded moral condemnatory communication, but it's addressed to the defendant and also to the members of the general public. So it tells the public, so that's the second part that I'm really interested in, it tells the public that, look, this conduct is really bad conduct. We take it very seriously. So seriously, in fact, that we call it criminal. And you all know how serious criminal conduct is, right? Um, and that's the message we want to get across. But the crucial, crucial part here is that last bit. You all know how serious criminal law is. Like it or not, the layperson's <coughs> understanding of what a crime is, is probably going to be shaped by a rough and ready understanding of the criminal law as it applies to natural persons. You think of your murders, rapes, thefts, that's the sort of conduct that, you're, that, that you associate with criminal conduct. Now, if you want uh, to apply the criminal law to companies in order to get that sort of reaction, you've got to make sure that the processes generating the conviction are roughly similar, close to what, what the, the layperson will associate with the criminal law as it applies to natural person, because then the conviction generated by the system is likely to be taken as seriously. That's the entire point, it would, it would appear. So that's one of the organizing principles in this paper. The idea that insofar as, as it is possible, it's a good thing to have a, corporate, a system of corporate criminal liability that runs as close as possible to the, to the system that applies to natural persons. So we don't want huge deviations because that makes it sound like this is not a real criminal offense. It's not a real criminal law. Um, this paper is, well, the focus is on what's called the identification doctrines. Now, the idea is, if you're going to apply ordinary criminal law to the company, well, you're going to be faced with a couple of problems immediately. We need an actus reus and we need a mens rea to commit, a, to commit an offense. Well, how does a company conduct itself? How does a company form a culpable state of mind? So that's the first problem that you're going to get up, get up faced against, right? Um, English criminal law tries its best to avoid this problem. So we have a lot of strict liability offences. We have uh, offences uh, that can be committed by omissions, uh, regulatory offences, basically anything to get away from this problem, vicarious liability as well. But every now and again, it can't. And when it can't, that's when it brings out the identification doctrine, which is essentially, it anthropomorphizes a company. 
it says that this company is like a human being, so like a human being, in fact, that it's these few human beings. And if they formed the culpable mental state, the company has mens rea. If they did the bad thing, the company did the bad thing. It, it's performed the act race. <clears throat> now, this device has some advantages. Obviously, if you want the criminal law as applied to companies to look like the criminal law as applied to natural persons, this is basically an adapter. It allows you to uh, apply normal criminal law to companies through the means of this identification doctrine. So that, that's helpful because it generates convictions that we're likely to associate with the convictions generated for natural persons. But it also has significant problems. I mean, the most basic problem is we have different judges in different courts disagreeing about whether even the same persons act for the company and think for the company. So some courts think that there's a group of people who are the hands and arms of the company, they do all the dirty work, and another group of people that think for the company. It's a sort of mind-body dualism, which is a theory that's, that's highly debatable even for natural persons. So it's a weird basis for, for an analogy with a company. But even if you buy into that analogy, um, it's not how the criminal law ordinarily treats natural persons. Ordinarily, it's not trying to identify was, was, you know, who is the actor and who is the thinker. It's, it's the same person. Um, so there is a sort of <clears throat> concern with that approach. There is some support for that, for that line of thought, but also there's another group of people who think, well, the same people have to act for the company and think for the company. So rather than splitting identification, we unify identification. Now that avoids theoretical problems associated with signing up to dualism. But we still have problems that remain. Right, let's say it's the same people that act and think for the company. Who are these people? We have at least three or four different tests designed to identify who these people are. And they might generate different answers. So we're left with a situation where we're quite uncertain whether the criminal law is going to apply in this case to this company. Now, businesses don't like uncertainty, and the criminal law certainly doesn't like uncertainty. So that's far from ideal. Um, what's more, um, whatever test you applied, whichever of the three or four versions in the menu, the test was, is likely to be narrow. Right? So only a very small number of people, right at the top of the company, are likely to be identified with the company. This means that in cases that absolutely cry out for criminal convictions, you can't convict a company. In the Herald Free, Free Enterprise case, well, even if you found the ship's captain, the ferry's captain was liable for this, the ferry's captain is not se senior enough in the corporate hierarchy to be uh, associated with the company. When you had uh, multiple train disasters, in some cases, it was a technical officer who was doing a technical job who messed up, and even though no one else apart from the technical officer was qualified and required to do that job, that person's not senior enough in the company's hierarchy to be identified with the company. So companies get away with stuff. And actually, I was thinking about this in the context of the Grenfell uh, fire. And there was a lot of understandable sort of consternation with the fact that the council is not going to get criminally prosecuted because no one senior enough has got their hands dirty. So narrowness is a problem in addition to uncertainty. Uh, connectedly, given that you identify only the really senior officers and you need that those people get their hands dirty, we see that there's a trend that larger companies get away with stuff that smaller companies wouldn't. Because the senior officers in larger companies are, like, uh, are, are going to be several levels of hierarchy away from anyone who actually gets their hands dirty and de deals with the public. In smaller companies, if it's four people in the company, it's quite liable, likely that, that the person that does the thing or thinks the thing is senior enough. So that, that creates a situation where there's a relative immunity for larger companies vis-a-vis -vis smaller companies, which seems a bit unfair. And connectedly, possibly to counter the risk of corporate criminal liability, you have companies setting up internal structures that are immensely complicated, basically trying to set up layers and layers and layers so you can disclaim criminal liability. Now, whether that works or not is besides the point. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But it does create organizational inefficiency, which you probably want to avoid for business reasons, if nothing else. So with all of these problems, which are well recognized, that nothing, not, none of this is new, you might be tempted to just give up on identification altogether. So there have been other approaches that have been suggested to dealing with this problem of corporate criminal liability. One is the reactive fault model, the other is organizational fault. Essentially these things, so these models have their pros and have their cons, right? Uh, 
I don't want to engage too much with the models because they have, both of them have one thing in common that I, I see as disqualifying for, for my present purposes anyway, which is that they change the criminal law or the way that the criminal law works too much from the paradigm as, of, of the criminal law applicable to natural persons. Reactive fault finds fault in the way the company reacts to the fact that something bad has happened, has happened under its watch. Right? That's not like mens rea. Mens rea has to be con contemporaneous with actus reus normally. Here, you're looking for mens rea after the actus reus is good. Uh, organizational fault looks for fault in the way the company was organized before, after, throughout uh, the, the actus reus. So we're essentially looking for bad character in a company rather than mental, bad mental states, which again is quite different from what we do for natural persons. In principle, if there's something that's really terrible that's happened, but there isn't organizational fault, the fact that the one person in the company that was responsible for it did it maliciously would mean the company gets away with it anyway because there isn't organizational fault. Um, so all of this is quite a deviation from normal, from within inverted commas, normal criminal, criminal law. It risks diluting the message of the conviction. So I don't want to go that route. Instead, what I want to do is suggest or propose for you to consider a way of reforming <coughs> identification. Um, and this is what I call comprehensive identification. Essentially, it's a fairly simple idea. All I say is, as a starting point, by default, that is, we should identify all the acts and all the mental states of each corporate employee acting within the scope of his or her real or ostensible corporate authority to the company. So every employee's acts and every employee's mental states are attributed to the company by default. You can change that rule up, up and down as, as the case may be, but that's our starting point. Now, why is that a good idea? A couple of reasons. Firstly, it's the doctrine of identification. So it's still an adapter which allows you to use normal rules of criminal law, normal with an inverted comma. So hopefully that will help preserve the modern message of a conviction. Um, secondly, it's um, certain, predictable, easy to explain to juries, easy to explain to corporations, relatively easy to apply as compared to existing versions of identification. Also, it corrects the, the existing inequality between larger and smaller corporations. All of them are equally exposed to criminal liability. It connectedly removes any perverse incentives you might have had to set up complex organizational structures that aren't really warranted by business requirements. Um, and I think probably more, more importantly, it generates what I think are fairer labeling results. <coughs> so let me explain that a bit more. When a company, when a company employee gets on the phone and missells insurance to a vulnerable pensioner, um, and later you find out that you've been, that this person has been defrauded. And you ask that person, who, who defrauded you? It isn't Jenny Phone Woman or Johnny Phone Man. It's Wells Fargo. Right? When you go to the shop and you buy detergent, which is uh, advertised for one price, but you buy it at a higher price, who's cheated you? It isn't John Clemens. It is the Tesco. Right? That's the person that's identified in the public imagination as the culpable party. This would allow you to get that person that corporate person rather than some insignificant <coughs> underling who you wouldn't remember. Right? Um, and that's sort of what the public seems to demand when it wants corporate criminal liability. So it gives the public what it expects and in that, in that respect it also helps reinforce the modern mes message of a conviction. Um, in doing so it boosts the effectiveness of corporate criminal law. It, it allows the corporate criminal law to potentially act as a stronger deterrent or stronger shaper of corporate behavior, let's call it, let's, let's say, than it currently does. Um, convictions in high-profile cases are likely to influence companies more. Um, there's a connected point that, that you could also make, which is not just that, not, not, not only does it do this, it also gives you access to doctrines that aren't available or ideas that aren't available in, co in standard uh, doctrines of identification. Uh, I'm specifically talking about <coughs> fault aggregation, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, so just a flag that I'm going to come back to this. Now, obviously, the main reaction to this is that's a huge change in the scope of corporate criminal liability. We've massively exp expanded it. And every time you propose an expansion of corporate criminal liability, you get the same standard set of objections, which, I mean, I don't think they convince 
but they're still worth engaging with, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So the objections to this expansion of corporate criminal liability. First objection, you say, well, if you convict a company, then who's affected? The shareholders whose share prices go down, the customers who now have to pay higher prices because fines are inevitably passed on to customers, um, innocent workers who might have to you know, be laid off because the company no longer becomes, remains viable, and these people are innocent. So we shouldn't be punishing those people for the company's crime. There's a couple of answers to that. Well, firstly, who benefits when the company gets away with stuff? The same people. The shareholders have their share prices go up. The customers get cheaper, cheaper shirts from Primark. Um, corporate employees get higher bonuses. So, well, if they're getting the benefits, I, I'm not particularly worried about giving them the downsides as well. But secondly, and actually more importantly in my view, the exact same thing happens to natural persons. So you convict the sole breadwinner of a family. Do you think that that's the only person who's affected? Of course not. The family is also affected. That person is a customer, that person is an employer, is an employee. There are people depending on that person for, for, for you know, household expenses, for support. Um, and those people are also affected. And we are, we're quite happy to impose criminal liability on those people anyway. Imagine the converse. Imagine if you, if you said, okay, um, we'll apply the same standards for corporations as we, as we apply to natural persons. So sole breadwinners of families are not liable under, under these offences because it would be too harsh to punish them. That would be absurd. And so the argument is, well, use the same standards for companies as well. Uh, the second objection to the expansion of corporate criminal liability is something that Bob Sullivan suggested. He said that, let's say you convict a company, but none of the individuals in that company, none of the employees in that company whose conduct is implicated is serious enough, you know, have seriously enough, uh, have done something that's seriously wrong enough to require criminal conviction for themselves. Right? So none of them are individually criminally liable. Even so, the fact that they are implicated in the company's wrongdoing might mean that their reputation is damaged. They suffer pension right consequences. They suffer disciplinary consequences. You know, this is something that, that we should worry about. Um, they're likely to be tainted by association. Again, a couple of answers to that. Well, firstly, disciplinary, employment, pension right consequences can happen anyway. The criminal liability is besides the point. You can, that stuff can happen anyway. And if these are people who have gotten the company into, into trouble, it's likely to happen anyway. And connectedly, well, these are people who have done something that has gotten the company into, into trouble. They're not the most sympathetic defendant. These aren't the people that are crying out for sympathy. They're, 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 they're being guilty of something, not quite a crime, but they aren't innocent. And to the extent that they are tainted by association, well, who, who is aware of this taint? In larger companies <coughs> especially, it's likely to be a small business community who deal with these people at the business level. It's not the general public. It's not like calling an innocent person a rapist or a murderer, where everyone is aware of that, that label and, and associates that label with this person. So I think that this concern, if it is a concern, and I'm not convinced it is, it is, is certainly over, overstated. So you shouldn't get too, too influenced by that. You might still think that it's unfair to let a low-level employee expose an entire company to criminal liability. Bob Sullivan does think that, uh, but I'm trying to make sense of that, of that objection. It seems to me that there's at least two ways to pass that argument. It's unfair for larger companies vis-a-vis -vis smaller companies, or it's unfair for companies on the one hand vis-a-vis -vis natural persons for, to allow small uh, or low-level employees to get the company into trouble. I don't think either, either version of the objection convinces. Firstly, let's say it's true that larger companies are more exposed to criminal liability because they have more underlings who can potentially get them into, into trouble. Even if it is true, what can large companies do, do about that? Well, they can train their employees better. They can set aside a fund to pay for potential criminal liability. Larger companies tend to be companies that are more able to do this sort of stuff. They tend to have more resources. But even beyond that, if it is in fact Wells Fargo that has been setting up uh, its, its policies for granting bonuses based on certain, meeting certain targets and pressurizing its employees to, if not go beyond the limits, then certainly to push the, the boundaries, then it seems to me that it's appropriate that the, that the company itself get into trouble. Right? I don't think that it's, that it's something that I need to particularly feel bad about when it's the company's internal policies that have been pushing uh, employees to push the boundaries themselves. That's in fact the organizing idea behind the organizational fault model. 
So it's something that I can give a hat tip to CEO Wells on. But it's something that I, sort of, it, that I think also works within this framework. Additionally, the criminal consequences to which a low-level employee can expose a large company will usually be minor. So these aren't people that will necessarily get the company into huge amounts of trouble. Um, the reason I say this is, remember the test is, it's employees acting within their real or ostensible authority. It's not employees when they go home to their families. It's employees when they are representing the company, either within the scope of their real authority or when it seems like they are representing the company, ostensible authority. It's very rare. I don't, I don't see how it's, how it's going to happen in any good company that your real authority will extend to committing a criminal offense, a serious criminal offense. So then we're looking at ostensible authority, right? Can a company do something to limit ostensible authority? Well, sure, have you ever received an email from the bank saying don't tell your PIN to even our employees? That's a company limiting the ostensible authority of its, of its employees. If you go to cafes and you see a sign saying, um, if you don't receive a receipt with this purchase, the purchase is free, that's a company limiting the ostensible authority of its, of its employees. So it's not like the companies are powerless. What's left, and there will be something left, is that low-level employees might still get the company into trouble, but probably not for something really serious. It will not be within the company's authority to commit murder or rape. Right? So you're not going to get a company convicted of that kind of an offense. You might still say, even despite all of this, let's say we've got a really good company who's tried its best to educate its employees, right? And it's done all, it can, all you could possibly hope that it would do. Even so, there's one rogue employee who decides to you know, go off the handle and do something terrible. Now the, now the entire company's in trouble. Surely that's unfair. One-off cases might be unfair. Possibly, but I think what's normally, what's, what's probably truer in most circumstances is that the one-off is getting caught. Not, the, not offending. That's true in, in the rail disaster cases. So yeah. the, there's, there's one rail disaster caused by a guy that, was, that mislaid, that laid wiring for trains uh, in a faulty manner. Turns out he'd been doing that for five years. Right? And the, in, the Parliament's investigatory panel that, that was set up to investigate this, they found this had been going on for five years. For five years, they'd been lucky. Uh, the Herald of Free, Ent Free Enterprise, they found out that on five previous occasions, they had come wafer, th wafer thin, you know, really close to disaster. At the very last moment, someone noticed that the ferry had set off with the door not closed, and disaster was averted. But it was a systemic, systemic continuing problem. Nothing happened in the first five occasions. <coughs> the sixth occasion, when something went, went bad, then there was a brouhaha. Um, Tesco and Natras, classic case on identification. Uh, someone selling detergent for a higher price than it was advertised. What are the chances that the very first customer who bought detergent at a slightly higher price went to the authorities and, and pursued the case to the point that there was a conviction? I'll wager there were several before that, that one person. Uh, it's the same with Tesco and Brent LBC. They set up a sting to find out whether, this, whether Tesco would sell adult films to, to children. Not because they had extra time, probably because they found out that, that this was a practice that was happening. And so there was reason to check. So I think that what, what's truly one-off is getting caught. It's not the offending. You might still say, well, even so, that leaves the chance that a one-off company, that, that there might be a one-off company that offends just, just the one time and still finds himself in, tr in trouble. In that vanishing, vanishingly rare case, it might still be unfair. Well, we have prosecutorial discretion, and we rely on prosecutorial discretion quite a lot for natural persons. So you have offences that are framed in very broad terms. Sexual Offences Act, two 13-year-olds kissing technically commit <coughs> serious sexual offences. And we hope that the prosecutors will have the common sense not to prosecute that. We're willing to rely on that discretion for natural persons. Why not for corporations? Apply the same standards, essentially, is what I'm saying. Um, you might still object that, and this is, this is a fairly silly objection, I think, but there's still an objection left. You might say that you might get a company convicted for an offense that can only be punished by imprisonment in this jurisdiction, right? Because death is not an option. Um, and surely that can't be right. You can't imprison the company, therefore the theory is wrong. No, therefore the, the punishment is wrong. We need to get better ways to punish companies. That goes almost without saying, but apparently only almost without saying. Uh, so, you know, there, there's ways and means of dealing with, 
with, with companies that don't necessarily involve imprisoning companies. But even if there is an offence, that can only be pun punished by imprisonment. And a company somehow manages to get itself in trouble in respect of that offence. It should be a matter of prosecutorial discretion about whether they should prosecute or not. So a matter of experience rather than a question of law. Because serious consequences flow from the conviction as well. Right? You can, for instance, be, uh, face reputational damage, which might affect your share, share value. You might be barred from uh, applying for certain contractual, uh, for, for certain contracts and stuff, right? Um, and those consequences are significant. They aren't criminal law punishment consequences, but they might be consequences that might be relevant. So the prosecutor should be in a position to decide whether or not they want to prosecute, rather than just set out a rule of law that says, therefore, <coughs> this offense is not applicable to, to this company. That seems like um, killing a fly with a sledgehammer, right? So it seems to me that the standard objections to, to expanding the criminal liability, the scope of criminal liability in this way, aren't gonna get us very far. What does this mean? I mean, all in all, I said that I was proposing this model of comprehensive identification for you to consider. I'm not actually suggesting that we adopt it. I mean, I don't want to go that far yet. I'm not a corporate criminal lawyer, and, um, and I realize the limits of my knowledge over here. I think a lot more will have to be done, done to figure out whether this is actually a good idea, whether it will influence companies in the way that we hope it will. What I do want to do to suggest by this mode is that some of the standard arguments that we have to say why corporate criminal liability shouldn't be ex ex expanded. Well, those arguments need to be interrogated better, okay? Because they don't seem to work, or they don't seem to convince, at least when you when you really challenge them. So this is not presented as a solution to corporate criminal liability. It's a challenge to existing accounts of it. And I think more importantly for me, what I want to bring into sharp focus is the seeming difference of standards that we have when we when we think about what's unfair to impose on a company and what's unfair to impose on a natural <coughs> person. So in a real person, you seem to be quite all right with treating them terribly under the criminal law. But you know, you, you take a fictional person and you treat them half as bad in queue, you know, deals of protest, which seems to me like we've got it the wrong way around. So if nothing happens to corporate criminal liability as a result of this paper, fine. I would hope instead that the criminal law across the board is moderated so it's a bit more sensible. And that's why I say this is a paper that's only ostensibly about the corporate criminal law. That's basically all I have to say. I'm happy to hear your questions, comments. Thank you very much.